Every Tuesday, Randy Neiman Brown does bring in immigration updates. Emily, what do we have today updates? We want to talk about the 540 day automatic extension for certain EADs uh, that was recently put back in place after it was reduced back down to the normal 180 day auto extension. But how exactly does that work for H4 EADs? Um, who qualifies for it and who doesn't? Then we are going to talk about traveling when you are on F1, you've already graduated, and now you have your OPT. Is it safe to travel at that time? What are the risks and precautions you need to take for international students? A uh, common question we're getting right now for those that have the adjustment of status pending, especially those from October 2020, uh, where the date still isn't current, what if I want to take a long trip to my home country? USCIS is giving these five-year advance paroles. Um, can I stay outside? of the US for five years and still continue with my adjustment of status. And then lastly, um, once you have your I-140 approved, what's the best way to um, get the H-4 EAD application filed and approved as quickly as possible? Emily, um, with the new regulation that came in on August 8th, uh, oh, sorry, April 8th, it said that uh, H-4 EADs are valid if you file an extension, extension is still pending then you can continue working for a period of 540 days even after your EAD expires. Let's say my year is expiring on March 16th. I file an application before March 16th for the extension. Does it mean that I can work for 540 days irrespective of anything? And No. Um, the auto extension, it's not like the auto extension of the green card EAD where if you file it before it expires, it's valid for 180 days or now an extra 540 days automatically. The H-4 EAD is a little bit different because it's tied to your H-4 status. So you only are authorized to get that H-4 EAD when you have valid H-4 status. And so if you have filed your H-4 extension along with your H-4 EAD, which is 99% of the cases, if your H-4 has not been extended yet beyond the validity of your current EAD, you don't get the auto extension. So you need to get your H-4 extended and then based on having the extended H-4 and the I-765 receipt showing that it was filed before your current EAD expires, then you can qualify for the automatic extension. But without that extended H-4 I-94, you can't use it at all. Yeah, it's a very big misconception people have that and we see a lot of people who when it was 540 days and 180 days a lot of people consult us later on after they burn their hands hey Rahul I have worked without authorization I realize that what to do so please don't take it as that it's a 540 days guaranteed no it's not it's only if your H4 is extended Emily what are the ways where when the when you know what are the ways where we make sure that there is a continuous employment for the H4 EAD? Can you tell some of the tips and tricks that people can do where they don't have to fall out of, uh, where they don't have to discontinue working or stop working for a period of time? Yeah, the number one would be file the H4 and H4 EAD along with the H1B extension, file them all together in premium processing and USCIS generally approves all three together in premium processing. So if you filed early enough, you're never going to have a gap in your employment authorization. You don't even need to use the 540 day auto extension. But if there are some companies out there that won't include the H4 EAD along with the H1B, I don't know what their issue is with that, but, um, or for whatever reason, maybe you were outside the country when the H1B was filed and didn't have that choice, um, there's an alternative um, involving automatic visa revalidation. Um, you need to do this before your current H-4 expires, but after your spouse's H-1B has been renewed. You may then have the ability to go to Mexico. You don't need the U.S. visa stamp because automatic revalidation allows you to travel to Mexico for less than 30 days and come back using an expired stamp. And when you come back, you can show your spouse's extended H-1B approval notice. And most of the time, you'll be given an H-4 I-94 that matches your spouse's 
H-1B extended approval notice. So you get your I-94 extended that way. Once you have that I-94, when you combine that with the I-765 that you already filed, now you qualify for the 540-day automatic extension. But that doesn't mean you go up to CBP after your trip to Mexico and say, hey, I'm here to extend my H-4 or, hey, can you extend my I-94? Um, how should someone actually approach CBP to get what they're wanting in that situation? Uh, Emily, you, um, for the H-4 year you're speaking about, H-4 extension? To get the, uh, at CBP, to get the H-4, I-94 extended. Just travel to Mexico. Ask for? Just travel to Mexico and come back. That's the best way to extend it. Don't go to CBP office. We have a lot of bad experiences. Um, you just travel outside the country and come back in. That allows them in the airport to extend it. We have done time and time again. It's a very successful. Now, there are some people who drive to Mexico and come back. Um, we don't recommend it because sometimes they call it as it's not a meaningful exit and they don't give them an extension. We normally recommend people flying outside the country and coming back. And make sure that when you're flying back and coming back, your current existing I-94 is still valid not after your current I-94 expires. So it is before your current I-94 expires, you should travel outside the country. And then another step that is always available is that you can always go to India and get the H-1B stamping, no, sorry, H-4B stamp, H-4 stamping and come back. But when you go to Mexico for extending and coming back and extend the I-94 at the airport, um, we strongly recommend to file the H-4 and EAD extension before you travel. We have had some people who just traveled without filing, had some issues at the CVP, which they didn't extend their I-94. So the better is to file the H-4, press EAD, and then travel outside the country and come back in so that there is no interruption in the job. Anything else, Emily, I missed out? Uh, nope, I think we can move on to F-1 traveling on OPT. Um, why would there be an issue with someone traveling if they have their OPT? One thing, what if, Emily, I am between the jobs, I was been unemployed for a period of uh, 80 days on OPT, as I know that uh, I can be unemployed for a period of 90 days. Can I just travel outside the country to stop the clock? No, traveling does not stop the clock. If anything, they're going to assume that you don't have uh, employment during that time and all the time you spent outside the U.S. will be counted as unemployment time. So that's definitely not an option. Um, there's also an issue if you have your STEM extension pending and you have not received the new card yet and you're traveling, um, you cannot come back in once your old card is expired, even though there's an 180 day auto extension there, you need to have the new card in your hand before you can return to the US. Uh, what other issues do you see with that? Um, especially if there is an unemploy unemployment period, they should check with the lawyer. As we know that unemployment period is allowed up to a period of 90 days. Uh, in the OPT period, they're allowed to have a, a, a internship without pay that's allowed. Uh, but if they are unemployed for a period of 90 days or more and they're traveling outside the country, that's definitely a big problem. Um, try to, you have to keep the unemployment within 90 days. If you don't have a job, and you're trying to travel outside the country, I recommend that you consult an immigration lawyer. If you are taking a leave of absence from a job that you're doing and your total unemployment period is less than 90 days, including the travel time, then it is probably okay for you to travel outside the country in the OPT. Assuming that your passport stamping for the F1 is still valid, of course, for all these travel purposes, we recommend that you must have the passport stamping valid. Otherwise, you should not travel outside the country. So if someone, uh, what if someone wants to go for stamping to get the uh, visa stamped when they're on OPT? Is that recommended? Uh, it's not recommended, Emily, because when they see that the person has stayed for a long period of time on the F1 and then now they are on OPT, they are going to get the stamping, they may, the counselors may not believe that person, that this person will return back to the home country once they complete the OPT. So we do not recommend going for stamping at this point. If, you, if your stamping expires, do not travel. Uh, especially this comes, Emily, for the people who are graduating in bachelor's degree, because for the most of the people who do in the master's degree, they get a five-year stamping. 
So that probably covers their master's degree, OPT and STEM extension. But when it comes to the bachelor's degree people, it only covers five years. So after four years and they're in OPT or STEM extension period, that may not be the right time for you to travel if your passport stamping is expired and you want to go for stamping, the council may reject your F1 stamping and that uh, in that case, you cannot travel back into the into United States. All right, common question right now. Um, my 485 has been pending for two years, three years. My date's not gonna become current uh, for the final action date for the next five years. And I just got a five year AP. So can I safely go outside the US, go back to my home country and stay there for four years and then come back because my AP hasn't expired yet? No, 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 Emily, you can't do that. Um, for multiple reasons, you can't do it. First, you must have a continuous job offer in the United States for you to get the adjustment of status active, uh, especially if you leave the country for a period of more than three or four months. It creates a doubt in the minds of the CBP officer whether you still have a job in the United States. Uh, I have a lot of consultations that are coming right now. Hey, my prior date is not going to become current in the next five years. Why can't I go and stay there for four years and come back? Yeah. And we do not recommend that you travel, even though you have been given an advance parole for a period of five years. You do not travel on it after two years. You want to come in it. Do not use the advance parole. File a H-1B, get the stamping again, and come back into the United States. For those people who are planning to stay for the long term in uh, outside the country, though, uh, there are a couple of options that they, they can think about. One is that if the company is cooperative, they can transfer this application from the from the adjustment of status to the consular processing. They need to file a form called I-824. It's a very simple form. It takes a long time for the USCIS and the Department of State to call you for the interview, but that probably is a very good step for you to get the green card in uh, in your home country if you're traveling for a long, if you're going to stay for a long period of time. The other method is probably go there, abandon the 485 application, come back on H-1B, and then if you're working with the same company when the priority date is current, they can file the adjustment of status, or if you're going to work for a different company, they have to file the labor and I-140, and when the priority date is current, they can file the adjustment of status. These are the two steps we strongly recommend if you're traveling, if you're going to stay in your home country for a long period of time. Anything else? Yeah, anyone? and with the um, switching to consular processing, the whole I I eight two four process, be aware there is no AC twenty one when you are consular processing your green card, meaning that you have to have the job offer from the company that filed the labor in I one forty. It needs to stay there all the way up until your date becomes current in the uh, Department of State and starts processing your application. Um, so if you want to work for a different company during that time and you lose that job offer, the whole thing is over uh, from the green card standpoint. So um, there is no ability to change jobs and continue the process if you are consular processing. Uh, since you're countered already towards the H-1B, you have an I-140 approval, uh, you can always come back in H-1B, you don't have to go through the lottery system to come back into the United States. So that option is there for you. Anything else, Emily, before I go to the next topic? Next topic. So I just got my I-140 approved. I want to get my spouse the H-4 EAD. Uh, what suggestions do you have for how to do that fastest? Absolutely. File an EAD application. That's one thing that you can do, uh, especially if you're filing an H-1B extension. Please attach the H-4 and EAD together. That's definitely a best approach for people to get an H-4 and EAD approved along with the H-1B. Um, Emily, what if uh, I got an I-140 with company A? Um, and my wife has an H-4 EAD that's expiring in July of 2024. I'm moving to company B. Uh, can my can company B file a H-4 EAD with company A's I-140 approval? Yes, as long as that I-140 did not get withdrawn within 180 days of its approval, you can keep using that I-140 to extend the spouse's H-4 EAD. Um, no need to get the new company's I-140 approval for that. Okay, what if I move to company C? Does I, do I need company B's I-140 approval to uh, to get the H-4 EAD filed along with company C? Nope. No, 
not at all. Uh, so people are uh, people are very uh, spectacular about what we are telling. It is true, guys. Yes, once the I-140 has not been revoked for 180 days after being after it's been approved, it practically belongs to you guys. I mean, you can't file the adjustment of status uh, other than filing with the company A. But practically, you can file the H-1B extension with company B, company C, company D using the company A's I-140. And the same thing is true for the H-4 EAD. You can use company A's I-140 approval for getting the H-4 EAD extensions. Anything else, Emily? Nope, we can move on to questions. Uh, Please, first question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You go ahead. Uh, so Rania wants to know if there's any chances for a second H-1B lottery. Definitely too early to tell because we don't even know how many registrations were submitted versus how many um, were selected. We don't have any details yet. And on top of that, I lean towards probably less likely that we'll have a second lottery based on the current scenario because we switched it to the beneficiary centric um, role. So we don't have all of those duplicates this time around. And USCIS has been doing this online live uh, lottery for um, five years now. So they have a pretty good sense of what the filing rate is based on the number of selections there are. So unless there's something crazy that happens with the economy and nobody files or something like COVID happens again and nobody files, um, I, I would not expect a second lottery this year. Question from Sweet Koo. I'm in compelling circumstances EAD. Will I get an auto extension? Let me explain for people what a compelling circumstances EAD is. If you have an I-140 approval and if you want to apply for EAD independent of the employer, under certain circumstances, you can apply for the compelling circumstances EAD that will allow you to get one year employment authorization. You don't need an employer sponsorship, but there are certain requirements that you need to meet for compelling circumstances EAD. And typically, it's taking about six to eight months to get this compelling circumstances EAD approval. Now, his question is that, Will I get auto extension? Unfortunately, this new regulation that passed in April 8 does not include compelling circumstances EAD. So you still need to get an EAD extension for you to continue working for that, uh, for continue working. Um, Archer says, I was selected in the H-1B lottery. This is my third attempt. Uh, my STEM OPT expires in June. Can I keep working from July to October and not leave the U.S. without any problems? So you can qualify for the cap gap, which automatically extends your EAD until September 30th, your OPT EAD till September 30th. To qualify for that, number one, your employer has to file the H-1B before your OPT expires. So if your OPT is expiring before June 30th, June 30th is not your deadline for filing the H-1B, even though that's the deadline, that's the window that we have to file. Your deadline is when your OPT card expires. So make sure they file it early enough. They have to request a change of status from F1 to H1. If they select consular processing, there is no um, cap gap extension of the OPT. Um, so as long as they do that, then you are automatically, once you have the receipt of the H-1B filing, you're automatically um, all, uh, eligible for cap gap. You can go back to your school, get a new I-20 that extends your OPT to September 30th. You won't get a new card, but your I-20 will show cap gap authorization. And then your H-1B will kick in on October 1st. Now, if there's any delay in your H-1B approval, if it's pending beyond October 1st, you have to stop working on September 30th. The cap gap ends in your employment authorization ends September 30th. You can stay in the country until your H-1B gets approved, uh, but you can't work after September 30th. Um, uh, Rahul Bhabha has this question. I sent my medicals in 2020. Uh, does it make sense for me to proactively send medicals for the USAS uh, which will never expire. My priority date is not current yet. Well, that's, you can think about it right now. As uh, what he's speaking about, Rahul Bhabha is speaking about, is that there is a rule that went into effect on April 4th that says that if the medicals were being signed on or after November 1st of 2023, they will be valid forever. Yes, since you filed in 2020, you filed the medicals in 2020, 
it probably is worth for you to file the medicals right now. But now one caution, Rahul, uh, what about uh, you, uh, let's assume that your prior date is December of 2014. And let's say that it's going to take about five to six years for your prior date to become current. Then the USCIS changes its policy again. Remember Rahul, from the time you file the additional status to right now, USCIS has at least changed three times or more uh, the policy on the medicals. So I'm a bit skeptical on it, but if your priority date is somewhere nearby, I would consider uh, filing the medicals. Otherwise, I'm going to keep it holding on it. Uh, Rupak says, but the H-4 is not always extended on premium. It's taking its own time, even if the main applicant is filed in premium. Um, that's pretty rare nowadays. Most of the time, if you file the H-1B, H-4, and H-4 EAD all together in premium, they are all three getting approved together in premium. There's every once in a while where the H-4 is still pending. Um, in that situation, the uh, employer or the attorney for the employer can contact the premium processing unit and remind them of the USCIS policy of bundling those applications um, and make sure they are aware that they are supposed to be processed together. And usually that results in a pretty quick approval after that. What are the risks of working on H-1B receipt notice? This question comes from Kelvi26 from YouTube. Well, the main risk is that if the H-1B gets denied, then uh, um, it may create some problems for you to find another job or to go back to the old company because the old company may not be willing to take or the old company might have withdrawn the H-1B. Now, in general, Kelvi, I'm not telling uh, you know each particular situation, but in general right now, the H-1B rejection rating is very, very low. I mean, it's. Uh, I would say that if a competent immigration law is filing an H-1B, I would fairly state that it's less than 5% only. H1B yeah. rating right now. Well, now this Actually, one. I have the chart somewhere. The data just came out. I think it's like 3%. Okay, that's good. Now that was quite different, Emily, in 2017 or 2018 when Trump was the president of this country. It was quite different. And right now, and that data of 3% includes some of the people who don't know how to file the H-1B application to Emily. Is that right? So if it's yeah. a competing, uh, 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 com uh, competent immigration law files, most probably the chances will be way less than that. Uh, Sandy from X says, my spouse's H-4 EAD has been applied for the first time. So I assume this auto extension does not apply. That's correct. Um, so un unfortunately, for any type of EAD, when you're applying for the first time, you cannot work until the card is actually approved and in your hand because you need that card in order to um, fill out the I-9 paperwork for your employer. Um, so yeah, and EAD processing time, a lot of them are getting better. Some of them are getting approved in a week. Others are taking months still to process. It's all across the board. Uh, Raj has this question, and this question is coming very frequently. His prior date is June 2015. He wants to move to India, work for one year, and want to come back. And the reason why he wants to do is he probably wants to move into EB1C category. His question is, can his wife, who is an H4, stay in the United States and while he's working on a, abroad for the company? The answer is clearly no. Your wife cannot stay in here. It's for you are on the payroll of the company. In India, you're no longer on the payroll of the company here. So definitely that is a big no. Uh, Nairup says, after the H-1B and H-4 extension, the but the visa stamp has expired, is it legal to stay in the U.S. or should we travel abroad and get the I-94 updated? Very common question, um, which is confusing. So if you're in the US and you have extended your stay with USCIS, when you get that approval notice, it has your new I-94 on it. When that happens, you don't need to travel to activate it. That becomes your new end date. You don't need to get a new visa, the stamp in your passport, unless you are traveling and need to get back into the US after travel. So if you're staying in the U.S., you can let your visa stamp expire. The visa is only needed to get you in the country 
Once you're here, it's your I-94 that determines how long you can stay. Now, when you extend with USCIS, USCIS gives you an I-94. You're not going to see that I-94 extended on the CBP website, and that's okay. CBP only gives you a new I-94 when you travel. Uh, what are the chances of getting the compelling circumstances EAD? Well, uh, assuming, you know, there are some, you know, it's always compelling circumstances. If you get the thing evaluated by a competent immigration lawyer, the chances I would say are definitely 90 plus, 90, 95% plus, I would say. Um, but you should meet one of the requirements or a couple of requirements for the compelling circumstances of EAD. Uh, you can look into the Google, but have it evaluated by a competent lawyer. The question, can I get an emergency AP advance parole if I'm using the EAD? The answer, uh, you're speaking about compelling circumstances EAD, John. No, there is no advance parole if you are using the compelling circumstances EAD. Emily, um, I want to discuss something on the adjustment of status EAD, Emily. There are, let's assume that I get a five-year EAD. Um, a lot of people are on an assumption that I can stay in United States and work in United States, which is all right. I agree with them on that. But can I just not work in United States and stay in United States on the adjustment of status EAD if I am the primary applicant? Not if I'm a dependent, but if I'm the primary applicant. So the whole 485 is based on the fact that you have a job offer for permanent employment based on the labor certification or I-140 that you have. So when your 485 is pending, you need to continue to have that valid job offer. Now, that doesn't mean you need current employment. You need an offer of employment. Um, but most companies are not going to give you an offer of employment and say, hey, uh, I'm offering you this job, but you don't have to take it any time in the near future, and you can just hang out in the US and do nothing for the next two years. Um, so, uh, no, the short answer is no, you cannot uh, just stay in the U.S. and not have a job, not work. Uh, there is no grace period like you have for H-1Bs, uh, but you do need to have that valid job offer. Sandeep has a question from Twitter uh, that his wife filed an H-4EAD for the first time. This is not an extension. He is now under the assumption that the 540-day rule is not applicable for him. The answer is yes. You're right, the 540-day rule is not applicable. She cannot start working until the I-1, uh, until the EAD is approved. Uh, Nisha says, I've received my new I-797 extension. Can I use my old stamping and new I-797 to re-enter the U.S. and get the updated I-94? Well, if you got your I-79 extension, that has your updated I-94 on it. So you don't need to travel just for the purpose of getting an updated I-94. If you do plan to travel and your visa stamp that's in your passport has not yet expired, maybe you filed a transfer, so you have your old company's visa stamp that's still valid, and you have your new company's I-797 approval that's now valid, in that situation, yes, you can travel. You can use your old visa stamp and come back in. You have to come back in before that stamp in your passport expires and you show the officer your new approval notice and make sure they give you the I-94 that goes to the time of your new approval notice. A lot of times they'll only try to give you the date that's on your visa stamp because you don't show them that approval notice. Uh, question on the uh, H-4 EAD. Uh, they filed H-4 plus EAD extension. The H-4 got approved, but the EAD did not get the approval. Are they allowed for the 540-day auto extension rule? Yes, but there is one other small rule there. The, uh, the H-4 EAD extension must have been filed on or after October 27, 2023. If the H-4 EAD was filed before October 2023, then it's only 180 days. But if it's filed afterwards, it is 540 days. Yes, since your wife already got the H-4 approval, this 180 days or the 540-day uh, rule is applicable. If the H-4 was not approved, though, then there is no 180 days or 540 days. They have to stop working when the EAD expires. 
Pranjal says, my attorney team says that they've upgraded to premium for my I-140, but I don't see any updates or changes online. Can I really believe that they did the upgrade? How can I track it? Well, um, once the upgrade is received, USCIS sends an email to either the attorney or the employer uh, confirming that the premium processing has been received. So you can ask them to forward you a copy of that email. Um, beyond that, I don't think the uh, online status always updates. So you can ask them to confirm if the check has been cashed, the filing fee checks, and ask for a copy of the cash check. Um, ultimately, you've just got to wait until the approval, uh, 15 or 30 days, depending on what type of I-140 it is. Emily, I have this question coming very frequently. I want your attention what I'm speaking about. Uh, these are the people who are covered under the Child Service Protection Act. Those people who file the adjustment of status, the children are under 21 according legally based on the Child Service Protection Act. I-140 has already been approved, adjustment of status has been filed. All four things have occurred at the same time. They are protected under the Child Service Protection Act. Now they are turning 21. And this question comes from Bupesh. Now, do they need to move on to F1 visa or can they maintain the EAD? Uh, do, do colleges consider AOS? I will answer the question I want you to correct because I know you are the person who speaks in these conferences on the DS, uh, designated student official and all those things, but I will tell my opinion. I want you to correct it, Emily. I don't think so. They need an F1 visa at all because uh, they are an adjustment of status. They have an EAD and nowadays they are getting the EAD valid for five year period and when they extend it even if by any chance they don't get the ead approval within the time of expiration they can work until 540 days with a new rule and the old rule was 180 days so i don't think so they need a f1 visa at all however there are some colleges that get confused and they don't understand are you a non-immigrant visa no are you on a green card no are you an advanced parole? No. Are you illegally in this country? No. Even they do give people admissions to the people who are not legally present in this country. But when it comes to the adjustment of status, they don't understand what an adjustment of status is. And they create trouble for this kid saying, we don't know what this adjustment of status is. However, if you come across that situation, we normally recommend contacting an immigration lawyer so that we can explain to the DSO that adjustment of status is a legal status. They're allowed to stay in this country. They are out working in the United States because they have an EAD. What is your opinion on that, Emily? Yeah, I agree. I think most people run into problems at the application stage with all these online applications for the school and the different states have their multi-school uh, multi applications. You have just a drop-down menu for what your status is. And most of the time, EAD or Pending 485 is not a status listed, uh, so you just got to get in touch with someone at the school, explain the situation, Get a, sometimes get a letter from an attorney that explains it. Um, but yeah, I as long as you've been confirmed that the Child Status Protection Act applies and the age is frozen, there's no need to switch over to the F1 visa. You can use your EAD, so you don't need to worry about getting an OPT or getting CPT. You can get all the same internships things like that, um, get cheaper tuition probably for most schools. Um, so you really only need to switch to F1 in the situation where maybe you're, you filed your 485, but your age technically isn't locked because it was filed based on the filing date, not the final action date and before the rule changed on that. Um, so most other people can let the um, H4 lapse when they turn 21 and rely on the AOS. Anji Pulsu has this question from YouTube. GC filed, age out kids get marriage after filing. Um, so I couldn't understand the question. If the age out kids are there, they're already out of your application though. If they get married, they are completely independent. Um, they cannot use your uh, priority date. So they will have to swim on their own file in F1, H1 and, and so on and so forth because they're already aged out. Uh, so that's what I'm assuming your question is. Uh, Arvin says, will my unemployment days be counted if I'm under medical leave of absence with my current employer while on the F1 DEM OPT? Uh, generally, they should not be counted um, because although you're not actually working, you are employed. 
um, and you are taking this leave of absence for personal reasons that based on the company policy that allows it. So as long as you have that employer employee relationship with the company, um, even if you're not working at that moment due to a medical issue, I've not seen that counted as unemployment time. Madhuri has this question. Can I change from uh, L1B visa to F1? The answer is yes, you can, absolutely not a problem. The second part of the question was that about the CPT, you're speaking about day one CPT. We do not endorse day one CPT universities because we don't consider them as legal universities, guys. I know that uh, a lot of people tell otherwise, but we do not consider that. We never considered multiple filings as legal, which we know. And you know what happened later on last year that USCIS is, uh, is definitely going after the companies that filed multiple H-1B applications. So definitely, uh, we still don't endorse the day one CPD universities. Um, Zoraf says, can I travel to Canada by road and use automatic visa revalidation? I have an expired F-1 visa stamp valid H-1B approval that's not stamped, what documents should I carry? Yes, yeah, someone who's obtained the F-1 to H-1 change of status in the U.S. Um, does qualify for automatic visa revalidation and you can travel to Canada or Mexico. So the rule is the travel has to be for less than 30 days. You cannot go for stamping while you're there and you have to have a valid unexpired I-94 when you're coming back. So you'll show your expired F-1 visa stamp your valid H-1B approval notice that has the um, I-94 on it, um, and you should be allowed to come back in. It doesn't matter how you travel, whether it's by car or uh, plane. A uh, question from Nidhi Shukla from YouTube. Can missing I-20 eight years ago, can it cause any issue on the H-1B application? I don't think so. It will cause any problem for your H-1B application. Green card, no, I do not expect that to happen. Uh, Juhi says, what is the process for the cap gap extension when filing the H-1B? My STEM OPT expires July 5th, and I plan to apply using premium processing around June 9th. Um, so you're filing before your STEM OPT expires. So that's number one rule. Um, once you file and get the receipt notice, you can go to your school and ask for an updated I-20 that gives you that cap gap extension to June uh, to September 30th, and you can provide that I-20 to your employer as proof of your continuing employment authorization beyond July 5th. Um, make sure your H-1B is filed as a change of status. Consular processing does not work. Uh, Srikanth has this question. My daughter is a US citizen who's 18 months old, currently staying in India with her mother but my wife is not bringing the child to US as a father. Please let me know what are the rights. First of all, we're not family lawyers. You need to contact the family lawyers, not immigration lawyer. It doesn't look immigration is an issue. And the main question that pops up for you is that did you give the consent to your wife for her to take your daughter? If you did not give the consent for, to take the daughter for that long, all this, it can be considered as a child abduction, a criminal case. Um, but you need to contact the family lawyer. I would recommend to contact a family lawyer who is familiar with the Indian law too. The reason is that uh, there is something called 498A, which you probably Google, you can Google it, you can find what that is. Now you do something, she can file something, you both file criminal cases against each other. That's going to create a lot of problem. Uh, better consult with a lawyer who has both Indian background and uh, and also uh, family lawyer here in the United States. Chandra says the H-4 EAD extension was filed before its expiration. The H-4 extension got approved, but the H-4 EAD extension is still pending. Does that qualify for the 540 day auto extension? Yes, because the H-4 has already been extended, assuming it lasts for at least 540 days, and you've already filed the EAD, you have that receipt showing it was received before your current EAD expires, that is what qualifies for the 540-day auto extension. This question, Malik Chikla has this question, do I still need to maintain the I-94 status? Uh, he's speaking about either L-1 or H-1B. Uh, while he has a GCEAD, my I-94 and AP both expand, applied for the renewal. Will that be a problem? 
Um, this is a more personal choice, so for people, if you want to maintain dual status, that is adjustment of status, and the uh, and the non-immigrant status, it's, it's up to people to say. I personally, when I was on a H4 uh, and adjustment of status EAD, I let my uh, H4 go and I moved on to the EAD. In fact, I started working as an immigration lawyer on EAD. Uh, at that point of time, when I was, uh, there was no H4 EAD, so there was only EAD. So ha I, I did let uh, let it go. Uh, personally, that's my choice. Um, normally, if you don't have any trouble with the employment history, with the I-140 uh, or any history, that's what we at that point of time can say, hey, you're free to let your non-immigrant status go. But if there are some issues uh, that are controversial things, then we tell people to maintain the non-immigrant status. Anupam says, for a five-year EAD AP, can a person go out of the U.S. for three to four years and come back on the same card? Definitely not. I know the card is valid for five years, uh, but as we discussed at the beginning, you're in your the whole purpose of adjustment of status is to give you a legal way to stay in the country while you are waiting for your green card. If you're going to leave for three years while you're waiting for your green card, then you need to convert to consular processing and go through that route. Um, so no, we would not recommend staying out of the U.S. for any more than a few months at a time uh, based on having that EAD AP for five years. Um, questions coming with regards to the advanced parole delay. Uh, we have seen a lot of advanced paroles when people are filing EAD and advanced parole, they are not getting approved at the same time. EAD definitely is getting approved faster. Advanced parole is taking up to 17 months. And this question is coming here so, uh, from a uh, 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 question is coming that it's been pending for 10 months. Is there any way I can uh, expedite the advanced parole so that I can travel? This comes from SNH. Yes, you can raise a service request, which normally may not work. You can contact the congressman, may not work. Contact the ombudsman, may not work. Um, the, all these three steps, typically the percentages of success is about 2 to 5%. Now, if there are some emergency things where there is somebody serious, maybe it's a 10% to 15%, things can work out. But if that's not where you want a uh, where, where you want to go a different route though then the only thing that we can consider is filing a lawsuit against the uscis they are supposed to adjudicate the case in 90 days which they are not approving it so you go to the uh, you go to the uh, uh, federal court but it still takes at least 65 days uh, for you to get an approval when you go to the federal court so if you have some immediate travel that may not still be a solution for you though Barendra says, how long is it taking for H-1B extension approval in regular processing? I'd say anywhere from four to six months if there's no request for evidence. Uh, I think we've received a bunch today that were, or yesterday in the mail, that were filed in November, December, January timeframe. Um, one second. A lot of questions are more repeat questions that I'm getting here. <laughs> um, can people file um, labor and I-140 approval while they are on the H-4 EAD? This question comes very frequently, especially for those people who move from a H-1B to H-4 and they want to switch back to H-1B at a later date. Yes, it is possible. You don't have to be in H-1B to file a labor certification. You can file a labor and I-140 while you are on H-4. You can file. You can continue filing a labor and I-140 while you're in student visa. You can file the labor and I-140 while you're in India also, so that you can resurrect the H-1B because going through the lottery is a very tough thing. Even if you go to India, spend one year outside the country, you want to come back. The lottery system is very tough. Uh, we strongly recommend if you can find an employer that can file a labor certification, that probably is a better way of solution for you. Uh, Optimus says, I'm in F1 status and my spouse has an interview for F2 next month. But as far as I know, she needs to apply for the H4 visa with me. What would be the option? So I'm assuming you have been selected in the H1B lottery and your employer is going to be filing a change of status from F1 to H1 for you. Um, 
to change status from F2 to H4, yes, your wife needs to be in the US on the F2 and then file the change of status. So it doesn't happen automatically, but it does not have to be filed at the same time that you file your H1B. Um, it just needs to be filed before October 1st, which is when your H1B would take effect. Once your H1B takes effect, she's no longer in F2 because you're no longer in F1. Um, so you don't necessarily have to file it along with the H1B. Adi has this question. He is an L1 and has spent three years. He got selected in the H1B. I'm confused. What is a good option for a council processing or change of status? Multiple things that you have to consider. Is it with the same company or is it with a different company? Um, that's one thing. Do you have an I-140 approval? You don't have an I-140 approval. Or are you in the process of the I-140 approval or you're not in the process of the I-140 approval? Will, will your existing company will file an EB-1 I-140 approval in EB-1C category or they won't? So there are multiple factors that, uh, that you need to consider, but there are also options where you can get the H-1B from company B and switch back to company A without going through the USCIS, without any help from the from the company where we call it as a margarita switch. You can look into uh, uh, YouTube and look into uh, Margarita and you type in ready, it's in TV Asia thing. You can switch back to H1B. There are different processes where you, you can switch to H1 and then you can switch back to L1A and L2 for your wife while going to Mexico and coming back. Uh, that's called Margarita switch, you can do that. So you have to consider all those options before you go for consular processing or the change of status. Amog says, can you explain the I-94 final action date rule? I'm going to assume that he means the I-94 last action rule because there is no final action date, doesn't really have anything to do with the I-94. So the last action rule is not really a rule in writing anywhere, but it's the idea that the last action taken on the I-94 is the one that governs. So here's the perfect example of it. You're in the United States, you file an H-1B extension with your employer, you get the extension approved, then, and it's valid until 2026, you exit the U.S. So that approval notice has an I-94 on it that's valid until 2026. After you get that approval, you travel, and when you're coming back into the U.S., because your passport is expiring in 2025, CBP only gives you an I-94 that's valid till 2025. So now you have two conflicting I-94s, one on your approval notice that's good till 2026, one on the CBP website that's good till 2025. Which one controls? The last action was you entering by CBP. So CBP is, is the last I-94 issued. That's the one that's controlled. If your I-94 just got cut short and you need to make sure you take action by 2025 to extend, not 2026. Adi Kohli is telling he has his I-140 approval. Uh, I don't know whether it's an EB-1C or EB-2 category. Um, and um, uh, it's with the same company that got, he, he was an L1 and he got the H-1B with the same company. Definitely go for the change of status. Since you have an I-140 approval, and your L1A expires only in seven years. If you just file a consular processing, technically you're not counted towards H1B number unless you go and get the stamping. So I am going to file the H1B extension, H1B uh, in the in the change of status, H1B in the change of status. Now people ask the question: Can a person file the adjustment of status in the EB1C category if they are in the H1B? The answer is absolutely you can. With the same company, Adis, you have an EB1C. So go for the change of status, that is better for you. The reason I'm telling you this one is that, what if the priority date doesn't become current in the next four years? What are you going to do about it? Then this H-1B is not going to be countered because it's filed in the consular processing. So definitely go with the H-1B. And there are another fear that comes is, what if after one year you lose the job with this particular company? What are you going to do at that point of time? For all purposes, it's better that for you because you have an I-140 approval and with the same company you got the H-1B, I would recommend go for the change of status and not for the consular processing. Anonymous friend says, how can one claim the green card um, when EB-2 NIW priority date becomes current and I'm in my home country and have no U.S. job offer? 
Well, that's one of the benefits of NIW, National Interest Waiver. What they're waiving is the job offer requirement. You don't need a job offer from the U.S. in order to get a green card in NIW. That's what they're waiving. Um, so you can proceed with the consular processing. So I'm assuming your I-140 requested consular processing. So whenever the date becomes current, the NVC will reach out and ask you to start the DS-260 process and move forward from there. Jyotirmai is asking the question, I am an Australian citizen. Can I apply E3 visa if I didn't, I didn't, because I was not selected in the H1B, I'm born in India. You absolutely can file for an E3 visa. Now, for the immigrant visa, so that is for the green card purposes, so you must be born, I mean, if to be considered an Australian, you must have been born in Australia. But when it comes to the non-immigrant visa, so it's the passport that controls. Even though you're born in India, you have the Australian citizenship, you have the Australian passport, you are eligible for E3 visa. You can file for the E3 visa. Um, SNH said, traveled in AP before and now my H1B got approved. AP renewal, I'm guessing, is still pending for the last 10 months. Can I travel and go for H1B stamping? Will there be any concerns? So for anyone who's in HRL status in the U.S. who has a pending 485, you can travel, get the visa stamp, and come back in HRL status without abandoning your 485. People who are in HRL status generally don't have to have advanced parole. Advanced parole is just a benefit that you get because you can avoid visa stamping when you have the advanced parole, um, but you don't abandon your green card by traveling when you're in HRL status and coming back in HRL status. Uh, Teja has received a notice of intent to reject for a STEM OPT extension uh, and OPT ex EAD expired. Uh, can I move to the another school with a day one CPT? Uh, first of all, we do not endorse day one CPT. Second of all, it all depends on why there is a notice of intent to reject is coming for the STEM OPT. Were there any status violation? If the status violation is there, definitely you cannot move on to the student. We, uh, to a different uh, uh, service system because you may have already been terminated from the service system. So those are the things to consider before you move on to a different uh, university. Uh, Karthik says, while well, switching employer um, using the EAD, do we have to enter file with the new company information immediately or can I wait until the date becomes current again? Um, so I'm assuming you mean the 485J supplement to let USCIF know that you're using AC21 and switching employers. Um, there's no requirement for you to proactively file that. We used to, when it first came out in 2017, recommend filing it whenever you changed employers in the hopes that it would avoid an RFE later asking for it. Uh, but we were still getting those RFEs later, and especially when the 485 is pending forever, um, it doesn't make much sense to keep submitting these supplement J's and just confuse USCIS. So nowadays we just wait until you get an RFE asking for it or you get called in for an interview. Vinay Kumar, uh, the question is that uh, H1B lottery has been picked up for an L1B candidate. Is it better to move to, L, uh, move to H1B or stay in L1B? Uh, well, as I answered the question before, there are strategies that you need to consider. Definitely moving in H-1B as an advantage because you can extend the H-1B once your I-140 is been approved. But at the same time, your spouse, if your I-140 is not approved, may lose the employment, will lose the employment authorization. So there are some ways where you can uh, move on to the H-1B for just a period of one or two days and switch back to L-1B. So there are certain things that you can consider. You may want to consult an immigration lawyer so they will tell you exactly how this margarita switch works. Um, Zoraf says, please provide an update on perm delay litigation. I'm considering joining in the future. Um, so in our initial case, uh, we are, um, we just had deposition with the Department of Labor last week. So that case is in progress. We've gotten some interesting information out of our um, discovery in those and so we've used that and recent very recently filed or are about to file a second one um, based on the updated information that we got so they are both ongoing 
and um, hopefully we will be getting some um, good results from those. We don't have any results yet. We've not been able to get approvals for those that are long pending yet, but that's kind of how litigation is. That's how it starts while you uh, kind of create these new areas for cases. M. Nagaraj Rao from YouTube has this question. I got laid off recently by the employer. The last payroll was February 25th, uh, but I was physically on site until February 27th. When does the 60 day rule start? Well, we normally take uh, we normally take pay stub as the rule of thumb, though. I don't know what do you mean by physically on site until this, uh, December 27th, but if your pay stub is lasting on February 24th, I will start counting on February 25th not on February 27th. Uh, Ranyan asks, is the Texas Service Center processing employment-based adjustment of status or are they transferring? Texas Service Center no longer adjudicates uh, employment-based 485s, so they're mostly adjudicated at the National Benefit Center or at the field offices. A uh, question from Krishna IA. His graduate is March 2015. Can you suggest the boat is about to leave for the Canadian green card. Would you say it's going there or would you say staying in the country? Uh, this is a very personal question. I'm not going to answer you the question, but I will tell you, Krishna, what I would do if I were you. I'm going to take the boat of Canadian green card. With my knowledge as an immigration lawyer, that's what I'm going to do now. Of course, if the priority date becomes current at a later date, I may want to come back on H-1B and file the green card at the time when the priority date is current. Now, if your company is very cooperative and uh, they can transfer the particular I-140 that you already got approved, you can file it with the council processing where you get the green card and maybe when the priority date becomes current, you get the green card of the United States without doing any extra steps. Uh, that is, they can convert the existing I-140 into consular processing. So you could achieve it, but if your company is not cooperative, if, if my company is not cooperative in that, I am still taking the Canadian green card rather than dealing with people like Emily, Rahul, and we have a new guy called Steven now, um, and all our team people, I definitely will take it. That's my opinion. Emily may differ on that. Uh, Talamala says, my H-1B expires uh, September 30th, 2024. I'm assuming this means the stamp in the passport. And my new I-797 is approved until 2027. Do I need to go for stamping again to visit India? So your stamp, assuming it's an H-1B stamp, um, is good until September 30th, 2024. So if you're going to travel and come back before September 30th, 2024, you can use that stamp but be sure to show your I-797 approval till 2027 at the port of entry so that you can get the I-94 uh, for the full validity period that you've already been extended. Hey, somebody is wishing a new year for me. Uh, yes, it is a new year for the people who speak uh, the language Telugu. Thank you for wishing Tarara and I also wish all the Telugu speaking people the happy new year. Uh, JJ says, if I'm currently about to start the recruitment stage of the PERM process, how long would it take to get the I-140 approved? Plan on 18 months because the recruitment can take up to six months and then the PERM processing is 12 to 13 months. Uh, then you need really another month to get the I-140 approved in premium processing, so at least 18 months. Is there anything I can do? North Carolina driving uh, license people don't accept the I-797C. This I-797C is not the original approval I-797A. It is the copy, courtesy copy sent to it, and they won't accept it. Most probably, I'm assuming, Dhruv, you don't have the I-797A. Uh, there are different options that uh, to do. I mean, I don't know how to deal. Each state has their own rules on their driving licenses thing. We can't control those states as much. We are just immigration lawyers. Uh, one, you can file for the duplicate approval, which is called I-824, that you can do it to get it. But that takes a couple of years, not a couple of years, at least one year for you to get the duplicate approval. You can take that. Or... What sometimes we do is that it's a very costly affair, but file a H-1B amendment. 
where you do in premium processing and get the H1B or whatever visa is, uh, you are in and get the amendment and get it approved faster. That's one of the other way. It's a very expensive way, but unfortunately, we don't have any other creative solutions. Well, it looks like we're out of time for today. Thanks everyone for joining us. We'll be back again on Tuesday, answering your questions and giving you the latest updates.